So, uh, good morning to all of you and uh, it's my pleasure to welcome all of you and especially our uh, special distinguished guest, Professor uh, Jagdish Narayan sir from uh, University of North Carolina. Um, so, uh, before giving, before starting the session, I want to tell that we have uh, in audience, uh, we have faculty from different schools and uh, also from different institutes and some BTEC students and, and students from different nearby colleges. Those who are interested, they have come, sir. So I would like to thank all those for coming. Our MTech students, PhD students are there. So first, uh, I would like to uh, invite Professor Narayan onto dais. Thank you, sir. I request Professor Ganesham Krishna, Director IOE, to preside the session and onto the dais. Thank you. Uh, sir, our Honorable Vice Chancellor has conveyed his warm greetings and regards to you. So, due to some reasons, he is out of station. He has uh, nominated Professor Gansham in his place to chair the sessions. So now I request Dr. Rajni Kant to introduce the speaker. Good morning to all, uh, dear, dear distinguished guests and esteemed colleagues and my dear friends. It's a great pleasure for me to introduce uh, and also, I feel I very much honored to introduce uh, our distinguished speaker today, Professor Jagdish Narayan. Uh, Professor Jagdish Narayan has got his B.Tech from IIT uh, Kharagpur in 1969, where he stood first and uh, first rank at the distinction. Later on, he has established an extraordinary academic career at UC Berkeley for finishing both Masters and PhD in just two years and it is a record uh, in that university. And uh, uh, in 1969, it's a uh, uh, very special year where um, many distinguished scientists joined UC Berkeley and Professor Narayan also wants to contribute in the same level and then he moved to University of uh, Berkeley though he got an opportunity in Cambridge University. And uh, later on, he moved to um, uh, <coughs> Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory and then moved to Oak Ridge National Laboratory where he held thin film and electron microscopic group before joining North Carolina State University in 1983. I guess most of our young faculty have not even uh, <laughs> burned. Uh, right? um, at NCU, he was uh, appointed Distinguished University Professor in 1990 and presently is holding John Fan Family Distinguished Chair Professor in 2002. And he has served NC State University as a senior professor for more than 40 years. And that's a record till, uh, till today. He has also served as a Director of Division of Material Science Research and National Laboratory and Director of uh, Microelectronics Center for North Carolina University. Apart from this, he is also a life member of several uh, academic organizations like NAE, NAI, and NASI. And his expertise is in the contributions, uh, his expertise is in ion implantation, pulse laser annealing, pulse laser deposition, and invention of domain matching epitaxy to create novel nanostructure materials like Q-phase, Q-carbon, Q-phase silicon, Q-carbon materials, and Q-boron nitride materials, and so on. These are a few of his uh, uh, innovations. And uh, for all this, he has got uh, an ASM International Gold Medal, Actor Material Gold Medal, TMS RF Mahal uh, Gold Medal, a North Carolina Science Award, and he was also fettered with Michael Jordan of Microelectronics in Chronicle of Higher Education in 2010. Without much delay, as we are all eagerly waiting um, Professor Narayan's insights today, I encourage each of you to take this as an opportunity and actively engage in today's lecture. 
and without further delay please join me to extend a warm welcome to professor jagdish narayanan and we look forward to an enlightening session thank you sir uh, sir um, sir um, thank you dr rajnikanth so i request uh, professor gansham to chair the session and give some presidential remarks Good morning, everyone. Uh, uh, on behalf of the Vice Chancellor, Professor B. J. Rao, I have uh, pleasure in inviting and thanking Professor Jagdish Narayan for accepting our invitation to visit the University of Hyderabad. I believe it is his first uh, visit to the university, uh, so I thank him profusely for uh, coming over and spending time with us. Uh, uh, so, uh, briefly, uh, just for the benefit of Professor Narayan and the audience here, uh, I would like to say a few words about the university and the Institution of Eminence program. Uh, so, the university has uh, 12 schools of study, uh, you know, covering sciences, uh, life science where we are sitting, chemistry, physics, medical science, engineering science, uh, and mathematics. We also have schools of management, social science, humanities, fine arts, communication, uh, uh, and, uh, uh, sorry, I forgot the other schools. Anyway, so the, uh, the university is a normal university which covers both science and liberal arts. We have about 5,000 students. And we have 40 uh, departments and centers which offer programs uh, in these areas. So it's a primarily a postgraduate and research university. Um, we have been uh, one of the top central universities in this country for many years. And for that, uh, we were awarded uh, what is called the Institution of Eminence status in 2019, uh, which came not just as an award, but with substantial financial support and a lot of responsibility on part of the university. Uh, essentially, the, uh, there are 11 uh, institutions of eminence in this country. Eight of them are IITs and the Indian Institute of Science. And there are only three central universities in the country which have been awarded the status, uh, Banaras, Delhi, and uh, University of Hyderabad. So it is a great privilege and honor for us to be part of this uh, IOE status. Uh, there are uh, several goals in the, uh, as an institution of eminence, one of them being that uh, the substantial financial support that we have received is uh, expected to enable uh, us to go into the, um, in, into what the government calls world-class institutions which means our global ranking has to improve, uh, for which we are uh, investing quite uh, substantially in uh, academic research and building the infrastructure. You would have seen some uh, buildings uh, going on, uh, construction going on. Apart from that, we are funding equipment. Uh, more than 75% of the faculty members, we have a faculty strength of about 400 now, and uh, majority of them have received funding to improve their uh, research programs. Teaching programs are also being, uh, uh, you know, invested in. Uh, the one of the most important goals for uh, the University of Hyderabad as an institution of eminence is to invite uh, eminent and distinguished people like yourself. Uh, to have a first-hand look at what is going on in the university in terms of research. and So in that sense, I'm very grateful that you have actually accepted and you have found time to uh, visit uh, some of the schools. Uh, so internationalization, perception, visibility, uh, these are things that we are very keen to uh, enhance. Uh, and um, hopefully, uh, the hope from the university side and the message from the Vice Chancellor is that your visit hopefully will end up uh, setting up a collaborative research 
program of some sort which can enable us to work on uh, very modern areas of uh, science and technology, uh, one of which is what you're going to talk about today. Uh, on a personal note, before I finish, uh, as I said yesterday, my a lot of my early research was uh, based on what Professor Narayan had published, and I continue to work on nitrides, uh, thin films, look at interfaces, strain, uh, largely due to the work that uh, I read in the mid-80s when I was doing a PhD. So it is in some sense a fan moment also for me that I have, I'm meeting the person whose work I've followed for more than 40 years now, uh, and or almost 40 years. Uh, and so it is really a privilege to be part of this uh, program. I again uh, thank uh, all of you for being here. And uh, I now invite Professor Narayan to deliver his lecture. Thank you. Thank you so much. It is indeed a great pleasure for me to be here. Thank you for kind introduction. I would like to thank Professor Patak, Professor Koteshwar Rao, and most importantly, uh, our host, Professor Nageshwar Rao. So today, I want to briefly describe this discovery, which is related to this Q phase materials, which have extraordinary properties. So I believe it's a new frontier uh, in solid materials and applications with the implications from high temperature superconductivity and quantum computing to lithium and sodium ion batteries. So if you look at the Correlations between new materials and technology, they are very strong. It turns out novel and improved device technologies depend upon new materials. If you take any new technology, go down the line, you will find the materials are the controlling factor. Throughout human history, you see that advances in materials have defined our human civilization. From stone age to bronze age to iron and steel, today information, semiconductor, is always the materials. So in that context, I want to introduce this Q carbon, QBN, diamond, CBN, and more recently, Q-silicon, it turns out this can be generalized to all the materials would have a diamond tetrahedron. However, there is a big challenge. These materials are metastable materials. But they have deep free energy minimum. Diamond is the same way. It's a metastable material with deep free energy and we can do whatever we want because uh, it's still it is stable. So we need, since it's a metastable materials, we need non-equilibrium processing. So in this context, lasers and ion beam both involve electron phonon interaction. And so they, they are they are playing critical role. So when you talk about the new era in Q materials, we have Q carbon, QBN, diamond, CBN, Q silicon, doped and doped, undoped materials, and they have far-reaching implications from quantum com computing to biomedical applications, as you will see. Now, a little bit about the Nobel Prizes for new allotropes of carbon. 
Nobel committees have been anxious to give Nobel prizes in the third allotrope of carbon. So in 1996, Nobel Prize was awarded in chemistry to Karl Kroto and Ismaili, who discovered fullerenes. Bucky balls, bucky tubes, which are called nanotubes. And they call them it's a new allotrope. And that's where there is a problem. It's not a new allotrope. And I will explain in a minute. Physics was also equally anxious, Nobel Committee, so they gave it to Gaim and Novoslov, discovery of graphene. Again, this is not an allotrope. What is an allotrope? Allotrope has to be structurally different. It has to have a new structure and it has to have a distinct entropy. And if you look at nanotubes, it's just but you have taken a graphite sheet and folded it. Nanotube or made a ball or a tube. So you can see it's a shape. It's not a new structure. Graphene it's the same old graphite, it's a one, two, three, four layers. And that has a very deep meaning. That means these structures have the same free energy. So you cannot repeat them. That's why it's very hard to make a single nanotube and repeat it. That means you can put array of single wall nanotube. A same way single wall graphene, because all these single multiple walls have the same free energy. And if you want microelectronics, any kind of devices which want the same voltage turn on, you can see it would have a problem. So I thought, when I gave this talk in front of Kroto and Ismaili, they thought they would disagree or vehemently. I said, same words which I'm telling you today. And end of the lecture, they say, they completely agree with me. These structures cannot be repeated. And now they understand why. So that's why these are not allotropes of carbon. Q phases, on the other hand, they are a third phase. They have distinct free energy. I can make Q1, Q2, Q3, and the interface is atomically sharp. And that's the definition that it has a new phase. Whenever you have two phases and they are separated atomically sharp, that means atoms have to jump at a lower, a different free energy. So you can see these materials have a very unique properties. Q materials is harder than diamond, tougher than diamond. It has, it is ferromagnetic. Q carbon is ferromagnetic. Q silicon is ferromagnetic. You can make them superconducting and they give best lithium and iron sodium anode structures. So if you look at the microelectronics, Figure of merit, which I show it here on this page, is 8200 for these high power devices for microelectronic is 32. It's only one for silicon. So this Q carbon turns into diamond. It's called mother of carbon, which I explain in a moment. Why? These materials are very hard to make diamond and CBN because they have a very high surface free energy. So if you remember, R star is minus two surface tension, surface free energy divided by the free energy. That means it takes large nuclei. That's why most diamond growth occurs People buy these grits and then they grow with using CVD. And that's how Diamond Initiative in India is surviving. 
but they always get defective diamond because although dirty seeds which they buy from China, they, they have a lot of amorphous carbon in them. So nucleation has been solved with the discovery of Q-carbon. Now I tell you the, what is the exciting thing, How, what is the essence of this discovery. If you take this diamond unit cell, as you know, diamond unit cell is two interpenetrating FCC. So the FCC, this one, with lighter blue, is the number one, and the interpenetrating one quarter, one quarter along the diagonal is a deep blue. This is the diamond unit cell. So there are net four atoms, the blue, and net four atoms. Now this unit cell has the lowest atomic packing fraction of only 34%. That means 66% of this unit cell is empty. As you know, simple cubic material has 56%, BCC has 68%, FCC has 74%, which is the closest packed, hexagonal, and FCC. But diamond, which has the highest number density of atoms, that's why it's the hardest, it has 34% only occupies 66% of the space empty. And that's where the discovery began. See, this is the diamond tetrahedron with the central atom. And next door, there's a diamond tetrahedron, there's a missing atom. So this structure is two tetrahedra along this 1, 1, 0 direction. And these two tetrahedra along minus 1, 0 directions with alternate holes. So you have four holes and four tetrahedra. That's the diamond unit cell. So I thought we want to, what we can do to plug in those holes, and that's what led to discovery of Q-carbon. So I take this tetrahedra, I can dope it, it's boron if I want, and when I repeat this, I call Q3. If I take this one, I call Q2, and this one is Q1. Q1 is also, when this, in one direction, in third one, comes here on the second plane. And as soon as you put the fourth one on the, in this the one minus one over direction, you get this. And this is the diamond. These are, you will get it when you expand it in three dimensions. But this is four atoms, four atoms. This is the diamond unit cell. You can see there are four holes. So th this, this is the uh, Q3. It has a 60% higher number density of atoms, 12.8 divided by 8 cube compared to diamond which has 8 a cube. And Q2 when the two subunit cells are packed and D1. Q diamond, when you plug in all of the holes, if you plug in all the holes, you will get 8 deep blue and four light blue. And that's the, this unit cell. And this is called Q diamond. So I can convert carbon into Q carbon. I can convert carbon into diamond. And I can create a lot of these interesting structures. For example, here, you, you can dope it, you can get large area single crystal films, you can get micro diamond, you can needles, and then you can convert Q carbon into diamond. And these discoveries have been very well recognized with three in a row R&D 100 awards 
for most significant technological innovations in the world, and that's called Oscars of Innovation. This is about the in detailed theoretical and experimental confirmation of these discoveries from, from Japan all the way to Berkeley, Professor Cohen, and UT Texas, Jim Chelikowski. Now, a little bit about the history of Q-carbon discovery related to silicon and germanium. We published this paper in 79 in Science, uh, and that was the laser kneeling of silicon and germanium, this paper. We can do laser annealing, that means fast melting and quenching, but we could not but we could not do that thing for carbon. Until 1991, we published another paper in science. That's when I could melt carbon and turn it into diamond. But it's still, I could not stabilize the process. So it took 2015 for this discovery to materialize. And that's when we now have this, this was the paper, in 79 paper in science for silicon, iron implanted silicon, where you could show that how the, you can control defects by iron, which were introduced by iron implantation. This discovery in 79 was the key to start launch of material research society, which is the most successful materials, physics, and chemistry society in the world today. And it started with defects in semiconductors and how to control those defects by laser annealing. That's how the... This was a very exciting time. This is a conference uh, in 83 where Nicholas Bloomberg, who had just gotten his Nobel Prize, and I was chairing uh, the session. I was the main conference organizer, along with Walter Brown and Paul Piercy. And this was a very exciting year, Walter Brown, all the guys from Bell Labs. Uh, this was a very exciting time for the launch of Material Research Society. And I present this, what it led to is the defects in materials I, how to control them by laser processing. So this con combines ion implantation and laser annealing. In 1991, Professor Bloomberg, and when he saw that we could do it in carbon, he visited our lab. And that was an exciting time. This is our group, which is doing uh, all this work. So now, Let's look at the phase diagram. If you like temperature, pressure versus temperature, that's called phase diagram. Diamond can convert, can be formed by melting. If you raise the temperature to 5,000 K and apply 12 gigapascals, which is 120,000 atmosphere. Once you get to this triple point, then the liquid carbon can turn into diamond. That's how earth core makes diamond. It goes to this, and then you can, uh, when you quench it, you get diamond, natural diamond. But we have taken this triple point reduced to here. So if you rapidly melt at ambient temperature and pressure, then you can convert carbon into diamond. So this method is a pulse laser annealing. By nanosecond pulse laser annealing, where there's electron phonon interaction, and that is a non-equilibrium processing and leads to phase pure diamond. You can get, but this is first order phase transformation. So you can get phase pure diamond 
without any carbon, which is very important for semiconductor process, semiconductor devices. Iron beam processing, it has a parallel because it has electron phonon interaction and at a high energy, mainly electron phonon, and then it has iron ion interaction at low energy. So you can see iron beam processing is equally powerful as the pulse laser processing. Current methods, which are based upon equilib non-equilibrium, like HFCVD, and equilibrium, which is CVD, you get diamond and graphite. Microwave plasma, you combine non-equilibrium component with CVD, which is equilibrium, and you again get diamond and graphite. And this is even more challenging for CBN. It turns out diamond and CBN are the next, the ultimate semiconductor materials. So there's a race uh, to get these materials in phase pure form. So let's look at this. This is the very telling, the free energy versus temperature. Graphite is the equilibrium phase, has the lowest free energy. Then you have a diamond-like carbon, and this is diamond, and this is Q carbon, which has the higher free energy. Entropy of liquid is higher, so you have a higher slope here, and it cuts through, as shown here. So this tells you what you can do. If you melt carbon and quench it from this temperature, you would get graphite or graphene, which is very interesting. You can create large area graphene, and you can control the time uh, uh, and the depth of melting, then you would have, uh, and uh, this gives you a way to create graphene, graphene oxide, or reduce graphene oxide. When you go to this temperature and then quench, then you get diamond. And if you undercool a little more and quench here, so this is the undercooling. Undercooling is the temperature between difference between the melting point, equilibrium melting point, and the undercool where you quench it. That means the uh, material is still stays molten uh, below the melting point, thermodynamic equilibrium. And this is called undercooling. And that was the key. Because this undercooling acts like a pressure. So instead of a, I get high temperature, rapidly melt it, and then I undercool it, which I like applying pressure, and I create this new material. I create diamond, I create Q-carbon. I must tell you, today I am really excited because I just got an email from DARPA that... Uh, they are interested in a uh, very big project on Q-carbon and diamond, which I thought may not. Um, so I'm really, it's a, a very auspicious day for me. So Hyderabad has done good to me. <laughs> okay, so Okay, so I, first I show you graphene thing. What a wonderful thing you can do for graphene. You create thin amorphous carbon, and this was the, on the left hand side, and here you laser anneal it and you turn it into graphene. The amorphous carbon is P type, and this is N type, depending upon. This is reduced graphene oxide. As you know, graphene by itself is not very interesting because it does not have band gap. So if you want to make semiconductor devices, you have to reduce it. But if you reduce it, uh, excuse me, if you oxidize it, uh, then band gap is pretty high. So you 
need to reduce it. So it is called reduce graphene oxide, then you can make devices. So here, with this, now you can make PN junction. You can write your PN junction just where you shine the laser, and these are very interesting ideal diodes. Reduced graphene oxide is ferromagnetic, which is a very big deal, because if you can make this magnetic, then you can get into spintronics, which means you can, instead of using charge of electron, now you can use the spin of electron. So this is a MH curve, and this is shows the uh, coercivity the, on the x-axis intercept. So this is a typical curve for so uh, MOS react. You can do same thing with boron nitride. You can make field effect transistor. You create amorphous boron, and then you turn into HBN. Now, HBN is interesting because it has a band gap, unlike graphene. So you can make interesting devices just with the HBN. You don't have to reduce it. Now, many of you wondering uh, about the laser solid interactions. You can see this is the uh, temperature versus time. You rapidly within a few nanoseconds, go to very high temperature, and then you quench it. If you look at the melt depth versus time, this is the melt-in, and this is the solidification. And this is the uh, differentiation of this. That gives you the growth velocity. You can see you are growing at the rate of 5 to 10 meters per second, making diamond. So even in 200 nanoseconds, if you put 10 meters per second growth rate, you can make a very big crystal. Microns, several microns. This picture shows nano diamonds. They are, these are five to 10 nanometer rings. And I'm showing this that each of these rings is a potential quantum computer. If you put one nitrogen, one vacancy in each of these nano diamond, that becomes a qubit. And for quantum computing, you need anywhere 8 to uh, 20, and that will do. And you can see most of them have more than 20 even. That becomes more powerful, you might need 50, but there are many which have a 50. So th this is a micro diamond, these are nano diamonds in the form of rings, and you, if you can make them talk, then you can gauze out with FIV this little structure, and that will be your quantum computer. These are the nano diamond rings, the self-organized nano diamond rings. And again, uh, you can think of all kind of interesting quantum computing devices. If these nano dots have to be entangled, that means separation you have to control, and then e just one ring is needed for your quantum computer. This slide shows, uh, this is a Q carbon and diamond. This is, these are nano diamonds, these are micro diamonds, and this is large area thin field. But the single laser pulse, you took a amorphous carbon as a single laser pulse, you can create these different structure by controlling the uh, laser parameters. And this is the one uh, which uh, uh, DARPA is just informed me that they want to follow to convert carbon into large area diamond thin films and make devices which is ultimate semiconductors. Because now we can dope both N and P type. So, so far you could dope diamond only with P type. So PN junction was a big problem. Now you can create a PN junction. Now, this is the detailed characterization. This shows high resolution TEM, and this is the diffraction for diamond, this is for Q carbon, and this is in situ yields. This is for diamond, you have 
from this you can see that is 100% ESP3 bonded. Q carbon has 80% ESP3 and 20% ESP2. And that is the source of carbon, uh, excuse me, source of ferromagnetism. You can create these 20 to 50 nanometer Q carbon nanoballs. And these are self organized. And since they are ferromagnetic, you can use them for all kinds of spintronic devices as well as uh, uh, drug delivery applications. But there's a lot of interesting physics why they uh, like to self organize uh, in a string or a ring. And it turns out you can, from the model which I presented, you can tell when they diamond cubic tetrahedron align in one O direction, it will be string, and in one one O direction, it would be ring. Again, if you take, so Q carbon is like a mother of diamond. You see there were three tetrahedra, and as soon as the fourth tetrahedra joins, it becomes diamond. So Q carbon acts like a mother of diamond which is very interesting because so far we could not grow diamond on sapphire, for example. For a very long time, you just get few diamond nucleating. Now with Q carbon layer, you can get continuous diamond film over a very large area, as much as so far we have been six inch diameter, but it's potential for 12 inch diameter. Q carbon shows extreme radiation resistance. It's a very interesting. We radiated, this work was done in collaboration with Oak Ridge National Lab, Bill Weber. And uh, it shows that after 15 DPA, DPA is displacement per atom. So this is equivalent to 23 years of neutron irradiation in a typical nuclear reactor. And it is totally robust. Except you can see these nano diamonds start growing with the fluence, which is very interesting. Now this is very, uh, when I took my first job at Oak Ridge National Lab, Eugene Wigner, Wigner cites Professor Wigner, who was the uh, father of graphite reactor. But graphite is very damaging. And he knew that I'd been hired to study the radiation damage in materials. So he called me and uh, I showed him the micrograph which I had about the radiation damage in graphite, how vacancies and interstitials are produced and uh, at a very high rate, and they are causing the damage. And he, he said something to the effect that, son, if you can create a new material which is radiation resistance, I will nominate you for a Nobel Prize. <laughs> I said, we see we're alive, that was 40 years ago, more than 40 years ago, but uh, is, this slide is dedicated to him uh, because this is, I finally I was, able to get in 2022, and I had this conversation with him in 1974, long time ago. So Q-carbon shows room temperature ferromagnetism, which is very interesting, because if you take as grown carbon, it's diamagnetic, M O S L E H, and this is ferromagnetic when you get this loop. The next topic is the high temperature superconductivity. Hardness and superconductivity go hand in hand. If you look at this second equation and the third one, Tc is 0.2 lambda omega square root. And this lambda omega square is eta divided by m, which is, this is a spring constant 
and this is M. That means if you want a high TC material, you need strongly bonded materials which have a higher eta and are low mass. And carbon and boron are perfect material. They are strongly bonded, have a lower mass, and that's why you can get higher TC. But there was a big challenge to put enough carriers to enhance this N0 density of states. So you cannot do in pure diamond because the thermodynamically you have only 2% solubility limit. But now with Q carbon we can go as high as 50 and uh, we can create. And uh, when we discovered this, I had a visit from Professor Marvin Cohen, uh, which is 92, and he was my teacher. So it was a very, uh, and uh, he said, finally, somebody could enhance the density of his states. Now, it turns out we can measure density of his states now with this high resolution TEM. So this is the 17 atomic percent boron, and this is QB1 with a three unit cell, and one out of the three has a central atom as a boron. And it has 37.8 K. It's a BCS superconductivity. Current record is the MGB2 with TC of 38 K. So it almost matches. But when you go to QB2, it surpasses the current record. That means two tetrahedra, and one of the tetrahedra has a central boron atom. And now you can get to TC of 55 K. And, and this is BCS superconductivity. It's not like oxides, which have D-wave superconductivity. BCS superconductivity has a S wave. It's a spherical wave function, and that's what's needed for quantum computing. So that's why there's a lot of excitement that you can now get to uh, 55K. The QB3, the spec, we are able to make only 10 nanometers, but we can study the density of states. We are not able to make the transport measurements, but detailed density of states measurements show that uh, TC should be close to room temperature. Again, very detailed. It has a very high uh, current, de uh, current uh, density. JCs are very high, like 20. Uh, million amps per centimeter square at 21K. This is very interesting. With the modern microscopes, we can study the density of states near the Fermi level, and then we can directly correlate with the theoretical calculations. Marin Cohen is the leader, but we can do now ourselves and show that how the density of states uh, which we calculate match with what we measure. This is the detail about the yields. And uh, you can see this is our this this is the amount. This is the room temperature superconductor. QB3. And you can see it's atomically sharp with QB2. See, this is a mixed phase, and but it's a distinct entropy. We have been able to make that much, but we need to make bigger for transport measurements. We can do cryo yields as a function of temperature and uh, show that the QB3 phase as a transition temperature anywhere between 90 and room temperature. Th this is the, uh, our uh, levitation of these materials. We can create now, uh, think of our new superconducting and uh, Josephson Junction and topological insulator based devices. For quantum computing, there are two types of approaches. One is Josephson junctions, which is uh, boron dot Q carbon comes in. Other one is defect, like NV, nitrogen vacancy. And that's what I would 
But before I go that, I want to tell you about the harness because superconductivity and harness go hand in hand. Nature made diamond, nature made diamond at perfect materials, hardest materials. Nobody supposed to overrule that hardness. But with this Q carbon, this is the theoretical for uh, bulk modulus. And you can see the bulk modulus goes a n raised to power of 1.17. So when I increase the density of carbon atoms in Q carbon by 60%, that divided by 1.17 is to give you 70% harder than diamond. So this is the theory which was developed by Marvin Cohen and then we modified it for our case and which we published later. This is the experimental result. You can see Q carbon hardness, the Young's modulus, is 1700 GPA compared to CVD diamond about 1000. So this is really exciting that it is indeed we can get 70% harder than diamond. Harnessing NV centers in nano diamond, I was saying you can create these qubits. So if you look at this unit cell, you put one vacancy and one nitrogen in this diamond tetrahedra. And if you put this unit cell in the one eighth of a unit cell, in one of these five nanometer diamond, then it becomes a qubit. And for quantum computing, you need to, need to self-organize them so that they can entangle. Interesting thing is that you have to align them exactly like one, one, oh, direct, one, one, one direction. And that's what we have done. If you take if they grow them on sapphire 001, then diamond grows 111. You can control the orientation, and you can see they, they, you can self-organize them. We have already made, uh, and they are pretty close. And if I can entangle them, that is a quantum computer. Th these Yonvi diamonds are very, very efficient. This is a PL measurement, so these uh, zero phonon lines of NV minus and NV zero. You can go from NV to NV minus either through uh, electronically or photonically. But here I show the time result PL measurement of the current materials and this material and is clearly far superior. You can tune this NV, NV minus ratio by laser power, or let's say electronically, photonically, and and uh, then, and this is the NV to NV minus ratio uh, is the key as shown here for quantum computing. Another very interesting application of Q carbon is is a very high field emission. You send in one electron, you get. 10,000 electrons. And uh, so this is shows the, it's a, because of high, it has a high electronegativity, higher than diamond, and that's why it has a very high field emission. Now we can make PN junctions, as shown here. This is the structure. Now we can dope it P and N type and create this PN junction, and this is the ideal uh, diode factor, transi uh, PN junction diode. Because now we can do both P and N type, so that, that's a very big deal. Q carbon and Q silicon based materials are ideal for anodes in lithium ion batteries because they can increase the efficiency by factor three. 
And this work we did in collaboration with Oak Ridge National Lab and shows that you can enhance. Uh, this is not the optimized end, but it's still, uh, without graphite gives you about 250 and this giving you close to 500. So this is already a factor of two. You can this, do the same thing in BN. BN is more interesting than diamond because boron oxide, like a silicon oxide, acts as a gate insulator. So the, the combining carbon, uh, diamond, CBN, uh, is a very powerful, that's the way is the future. So here, uh, you take this triple point, which is at 3500 K, and, uh, and 9.5 GPA, excuse me, uh, yeah, uh, and then you undercool to 2800 K at ambient pressure, and they turn QBN, in, uh, C, uh, amorphous BN into CBN. This is similar to that. Uh, to make phase pure CBN is a very big challenge because unlike diamond, uh, it does not have a preferential etching for HBN. So you get both, if you use the equilibrium, non-equilibrium processing, you get mixture of HBN and CBN. Now you can get phase pure. You can do Raman and this black is Raman spectrum from HBN and this is from CBN. This is the phase pure uh, CBN. Again, when you do something like that and claim you have to do very detailed uh, structure, atomic structure. Uh, this is a CBN by this method. This is a QBN. This is detailed yields. So this is a structure. This is bonding. And then uh, we can correlate the SP3, SP2 ratio with the atomic structure. You can create uh, HBN, CBN epitaxially. And this is the uh, diamond growing epitaxially on CBN, and this, this is the intensity uh, and shows as you expect from this heterostructure. This shows very detailed uh, yields from this, because yields is the most powerful technique when it comes to uh, the bonding characteristics of these materials. Okay, so with that, let me conclude. What are the unique properties of Q-carbon and diamond-related materials? First of all, the most exciting thing is that b dot q has a new record for BCS, high temperature superconductivity, of TC of 55K. And it's going higher. It carries high critical current density because there are dangling bonds which act like a flag, uh, flag spinning between these diamond tetrahedra. Now we can think of uh, superconducting qubits and Maurana of fermion based devices. Pure undoped Q carbon is ferromagnetic. And, the, uh, and it shows robust uh, ro room temperature ferromagnetism, extraordinary Hall effect. Is biocompatible and is ideal for drug delivery. You take one of those few carbon nanobars, you can coat them with drugs and you can tell which cancer cell to go, which affected area to go. And when these Q bars go to the cancer cell, cell invites them. What it means is that when Q carbon stays with the cell, cell becomes stronger and then the drug uh, also does the repair work. Q-carbon is harder, tougher, and more adherent than diamond. So it's ideal for cutting tools and coatings. We have a big program on with the uh, uh, NOV uh, company for uh, creating these deep sea drilling tools. Q-carbon exhibits record field emission because of this high negative electron affinity. 
It's ideal for free limbs and displays, contactless electric motors and all that. I didn't have for this fifth thing, it is also electrochromic. Now we can dope N and P type, far higher than the thermodynamic solubility limit. And uh, we can think of now all these integrated circuits and high power devices. I didn't have time to present SIV nano diamonds. Yes, just covered NV diamonds. And this will lead to room temperature quantum computing. In the Josem subjunction, you have you are uh, limited to the superconducting transition temperature. But Q carbon, uh, excuse me, NV dope diamond nano diamonds, you can get uh, room temperature quantum computing, quantum sensing, and quantum communication. Most recently, we have shown that you can take carbon nanofibers, nanotubes and you can convert them into diamond. Each pulse gives you 50 nanometer uh, rod, for example, and the next pulse gives you another. So you, it's called pseudo taptactic growth. That means the seed from the top and then comes down. We have parallel results from uh, HBN, QBN, CBN. Uh, and I just showed you very briefly that Q-carbon, Q-silicon uh, can uh, enhance the lithium ion battery current capacity by factor of three. And uh, this should work for all the materials which are zinc blend structure. So there would be a lot of exciting thing coming from all of these materials which includes germanium, silicon carbide, gallium arsenide. So please, thank you very much. This is exciting, but I love to answer questions. Sir, thank you very much for a wonderful lecture. Because actually you have touched the most fundamental topics, all topics of physics and up to applications into electronics. So after seeing abstract, I got excited. All topics from crystal structure to everything is there. So now the session is open for questions. Please ask any questions. Why have you named it Q-carbon? What is yeah. the reason for naming it as Q-carbon? Why Q? Yeah. Q is quenching. The oh. first time we made it is a quenching when it's called it. But uh, okay. when we published the paper, you know, they said we should name it to Nari and Carbon. Okay. My wife said, no, no, that's too egotistical. You just say it. And I think that was a good idea. So, for making this Q carbon, so ion beam is a better method or a laser freezer that, that, that can occur? It turns out if you want a large area, which, uh, uh, which we are just funded for that because uh, a large area for uh, microelectronics, then you use that. For a laser, each time you get about an inch square. Right. And you have to. Repeat. Repeat it, and you have to make sure the boundary don't get messed up. Okay. With the uh, ion, beam. ion, you can get one big size. Uh, we have already made six. Okay. Okay. Thank you, uh, sir. Uh, one minute before taking question, I will ask one question, sir. Yes. Sir, please tell how you made this because of how to make Q carbon. Okay, Q carbon. Uh -huh. You simply deposit a mark first thin film, and then just, you, you have to be uh, manipulate, optimize, find a sweet spot, and you just did the pulse laser. And then you can get a graphene, you can get diamond, or you can get two diamond. So with pulse laser, we have to do some quenching. Uh, is it the laser quen inherent quenching, or all, also we are doing thermally? So automatically get quenching. Quenching with, uh, yeah. because of laser pulse. Yeah, yeah. laser, the short pulse. Yes. And the thermal conductivity determines. Yeah. So you have to make sure the thermal conductivity is right of the film as well as the substrate. And you have to go to that in this part. Okay. So Dr. Rajnikan. Sir, uh, exclusively from ferromagnetism, when you talked about ferromagnetism, yeah. I saw that the saturation field is around 5000 oysters. Yeah. But 
So the, when you refer to magnetic field, uh, does it, the dimensions is very low. So how do we go for uh, uh, applications uh, where we want to use paramagnetic field? So it, if you look at the DC, uh, you know, saturation. Yeah, saturation is around 5,000 or so. Yeah. 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 So the moment you reduce the uh, C less than 5,000, the magnetization is dropping. To, uh, and uh, that characteristics you can control by controlling the structure. So you can get a, you know, higher by controlling the atomic structure. Uh, sir, in this uh, laser annealing, yes. uh, that uh, generally the power which you use will be very low. No, you have to melt it. So it's uh, it's like a 0.6 joule per centimeter square. But if you divide by 20 nanoseconds, it's 30 megawatt. So it's, it's a pretty high power. It's like putting three nuclear reactors. Okay. But it's very very short time. Okay. So you are uh, the uh, the amorphous carbon you deposit by using what source? What is the source material for amorphous carbon? Just plain one. Yeah. Uh, okay, that you make that uh, you make the film of amorphous carbon using uh, thermal evaporation or uh, uh, again using uh, PLD? What, how the, you? The, you can you do thermal evaporation or PLD. As I said, you can take a carbon nanofiber and you can melt the end and that will turn into that. Or you can take a nanotube and you could turn that into diamond. In fact, that's the ideal material for field emission. That means if you have a lot of these nanotubes, and if you can turn the tip of those into nano diamond, that would be ideal field display material. Because then uh, the electron can be transported around the conducting nanotubes, and this diamond, nano diamond, acts like a field emitter. So that the substrate you use is? Uh, we have used sapphire, okay. but it doesn't matter what substrate. We can do it on silicon, but the only thing is uh, the parameters would vary depending upon the thermal conductivity. We have done on glass, uh, but uh, as long as you, we have to use this computer program called SLIP. Hmm. And uh, there's a story behind that, you know. We need to use that program to find the sweetest spot. Okay. The story is my grandson helped me to find, because he was the one that helped me convert old program SLIM, which I had developed in the 80s, to turn into Windows. Okay. And uh, he beat my PhD story. So. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to know that uh, this, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, pulse duration, is it, uh, the, the, does that also matter? Yeah, that's very much. Pulse duration, 20 nanoseconds. Uh, oh. uh, but uh, uh, as long as you, if pulse duration is high, then you have to adjust the thermal conductivity. Okay. Okay. That's very okay. So when I showed those curves, you have to, if you can take those curves into account, otherwise you have to do a lot of things. Japanese are, they call some Quasimoto procedure where they very systematically uh, each parameter and uh, I said you don't need to do that, you need to do uh, simulation. You know. mm -hmm. But uh, uh, yeah, if you do simulation, you don't have to do all the 100 experiments. Oh, thank you. Sir, I have this question. So we use a diamond indenter for measuring the hardness, yeah. assuming that the diamond is the hardest. No, 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 no. So gee, 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 gee. You don't use, uh, yeah, that, I know what you, uh, how could you they make the hardness measurements of a material which is harder than diamond, it will break it. No, you don't do that. Uh, you do the AFM and you just uh, see how much it takes to get a very uh, depression, which is one nanometer. You don't uh, go very deep. So all it is, uh, all you have to do is uh, show how much it takes to, uh, you know, bend. Uh, you create this depression, but you don't go very deep because that that that, that would not work. So this uh, the AFM technique where. Uh, 
uh, you, you just go only 10 nanometer and measure the hardness. So that's why I'm asking Professor Rao if he has his AFM ready. He says yes, he has. Hello, sir. Sir, how many how many pulses do you use for the question? How many pulses? Laser pulses used for annealing? One pulse. You one need pulse. one pulse, yes, to so, the jar. Okay. Uh, but if you turn into Q and you put second pulse, then that will turn into that. But uh, usually, graphene you want one pulse, diamond one pulse. In multiple pulses are. Uh, Dime, nothing will happen to diamond. For example, you could convert the top layer into diamond, the next one would convert deeper and so forth. But usually if you optimize, see if you want to, uh, the deal is how to go epitaxial diamond. See, making diamond is not a big deal. People have been making diamond since then. So what it is, right now, white dark are just in the farm and they want to go q carbon way. Because if you deposit the thin film of q carbon then this Q carbon connects with the substrate and then then give you the epitaxy. Uh, sir, uh, will it happen only on the surface or uh, will it extend to the deep of the substitute? Yeah, it will go deeper up uh, to, yeah. How much substitute does it? You mean the, the how thick, uh, you, yeah. can have, uh, you can create a half a micro, half a micron Yeah. How far we are from the room temperature superconductivity in this case? Yeah. Uh, I, I think, as I said, I made 10 nanometers, and that's yeah. a very good question because that's what, uh, you know, okay, we are trying to create. Data from somebody from Harvard, he said that he has gone and then he has to retract it. No, no, no that's all garbage, you know, this yeah. is the real thing. See, this is, one should understand, when these people publish a paper, they do one or two characterization techniques, okay. They measure either the TC or just, you saw, we, if you look at our papers, we go from A to Z, all things together. In fact, as soon as these guys publish a paper and they ask my opinion, I tell them it's all garbage. Because these were materials with low divide temperature. Like your IISC guys, I hope there's nobody from IISC. <laughs> <laughs> they had some crazy gold copper alloy, and they thought it's a room temperature superconductor. Mm -hmm. Professor Sian Rao, he was my undergraduate advisor, so he, he sent me a note, uh, please comment on it. I said, don't pay attention, it would be same IISC, the total garbage. And, but they thought they would get Nobel Prize, that's why IISC wanted to continue. The Korean guy, I don't know, some of you know, some crazy thing. They claimed, and the uh, pres president of Korea was involved. Uh, he, he decided that only three guys should be there so they can get a Nobel Prize. They sent it to me. I told them that nature public uh, total garbage. There's a guy from Rochester, Diaz. His name is Yeah, I was talking about Diaz. Yeah, Diaz going to jail. Mm -hmm. Because he uh, really it was totally fraudulent, and I told him, Marvin Cohen, send me that peace comment. You are a materials guru. Guru is telling his student I'm guru, but I told him that please don't pay any attention. This is total uh, garbage. Because he was claiming to make these materials in amount of time which you would not be allowed from, if you, if you, if you, to make a material, you need to allow to, uh, uh, for atoms to settle and make a phase. She was claiming to make materials which atom would have one or two atomic distances, and he was claiming he made a micron that, uh, long this and micron long that. <laughs> this guy does not understand Yeah, people are in a hurry to get the Nobel Prize. <laughs> yeah, just, so, she is going to jail, by the way. <laughs> I know it's, it's, a lot of people think he's of Indian origin. I said, no, he's of Sri Lankan, I think. Uh, but it's really sad, you know, that uh, he also, they found out that he also will plagiarize his PhD thesis. 
sir it was really wonderful sir uh, i have a question um, related to the size of nano diamond uh, which has a potential application in quantum computations what is the optimum size of nano diamonds that you are showing me today 5 nanometer 5 nanometer 1 nitrogen one vacancy preferably in the middle of this little guy okay and that becomes quantum and also i'm also kind of uh, like q silicon based uh, uh, Q uh, lithium and, and sodium ion batteries. How these play important role to improving the efficiency? The Q silicon and yeah, so Q carbon. As you know, anodes of these batteries, which is lithium or sodium, they may they they have a graphite, and then the anode uh, cathodes are made of the uh, you know the uh, lit, uh, NMC eight eleven and all these materials. they are so they control the voltage but the current is controlled by the anode the how many trapped lithium so currently they are using graphite and graphite means the the word you know the hexagon ring and one lithium can sit so for every six carbon atoms there is only one lithium so efficiency is 1 over 6 With the tetrahedron, you, I showed you four holes in the unit cell. So you put four. So for every one tetrahedron, you have a one lithium and one sodium. This is one over two because tetrahedron has less than two. Yeah. Uh, excellent lecture. Uh, I have ten. Uh, if you look at uh, lithium and battery and if you are using silicon as an anode material one of the problem people are faced is the volume expansion yeah. have you seen any kind of a, you know artifact when you used to cure uh, silicon as an anode we are mixing q carbon with q silicon then that problem is remember these are uh, amorphous material so they are pretty uh, they are not prone to that problem another question is that most of the raman signatures what you see like uh, they are little bit distorted compared to the parent structures is it because of the amorphous nature like it, especially in diamond diamond and q diamond we could see some splitting of the raman peaks only thing no they know splitting i i can we can talk after that they, they just gives you 1332 it does shift when you are in v diamond then it will quantum shift to lower value if there is a strain it stays up shift and uh, size down shift so if you have two together uh, nano diamond and uh, and you have a strain then then it might have a little split otherwise uh, you know for my my micro diamond they are pure as you can get you saw this see that's why there is no room for this you saw the atomic structure these are so clean uh, that there there is no room for misinterpretation thank you
calculation. Have you measured the growth rate for a single pulsed laser LED? Okay, growth rate, just you measure the size. And from simulation, you know the time. So okay, I don't so measure it, it is yet. Not, uh, when yeah, I it, was is, a, it is only like from the simulation because uh, like yeah, you it don't vary the, 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 the I measure the size experimentally. Yeah. Okay. So I know how big it had grown. Yes. And then you I know the, the time pursuit. from simulation. Okay. Now, yeah, that, that's the. Uh, now, when I was at Oak Ridge, we did an experiment for silicon uh, where we did uh, measure the reflectivity uh, in a synchrotron as a function of time. So, in situ X ray diffraction, there we could measure that. This is all consistent. So, all our modeling is consistent with the experimental results which we had done long time ago in silicon. Uh, sorry, uh, one more doubt. Uh, this uh, Q phase is only achieved because of the uh, higher rate of cooling achieved in the undercooling or uh, is there any other method to prepare that actually, this Q phase carbon and uh, silicon? It is related to non-equilibrium aspect because these are metastable structures so it is related to quenching in laser annealing and uh, this, this uh, iron implantation is related to creating uh, uh, frankel pair and adding that force to the Okay, uh, yes. uh, into, See, you suck QB1, QB2, QB3, okay, and they have a distinct uh, uh, TC. Okay. So that's one. If you look at the diagram, uh, you do the cross section TEM. These phases are separated by atomically short boundary. That, what it tells you that entropy, is, see the, the fundamental definition of a new phase is that uh, there is a distinct drop in entropy or increase in entropy. This would be, uh, so that's what you see when you have a targetically short interface that the, the entropies are distinctly different. It tells you the structure are distinctly different and uh, which is the definition of element. So uh, what kind of symmetry operations are required to repeat the structure? What kind of? Symmetry operations. Battery? Symmetry. 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 For example, if, if you see the diffuse interface, that's the definition of second order phase transformation. And the, the, you will not be able to uh, claim that it is a separate phase. So the sharpness of the interface defines. This kind of translation is symmetry. Yeah. Okay. Oh, translation symmetry. Okay. Okay. That's a good question. I do know this enough. Q carbon is uh, not a translation symmetry. You know, to do the theoretical calculation, you have to go to Q diamond. And from there, so right now, your know, theory is. I mean, I, I was in I, I, Bill Anderson invited me to give a talk at Krishna, and he wanted to do calculations, but uh, he, there is no boundary. So, about first materials, you have to have a model where you can have a pediatric boundary. So, the, the, we have done calculations using that two diamond crystalline system. And from there, we extrapolate. So, uh, it's a very exciting uh, discussion. You have stimulated a uh, lot of questions, sir. Thank you very much. So, uh, this is, I would like to thank the speaker for a wonderful lecture and audience for active participation. So, this is time to felicitate our guest. I request uh, Professor Patak and Professor Nangya.
to felicitate the speaker. I request Professor Gansham to accompany them. Now this uh, momento from university for the distinguished lectures. Uh, thank you so much, sir. And uh, we will state the speaker. Thank you very much. A very small momento uh, from Nano Center, sir. There's a uh, cup. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> And uh, I request Professor Gansham to give small mementos to Professor Patek and Professor Nangla. They are bringing. Actually, Professor Patek has established this connection through which I could invite. Uh, Professor Jain Narayan here. So, on behalf of Nano Center, uh, <laughs> thank you very much, sir. Thanks to all of you and. Uh, so now it's uh, Thank you so, much. so I request uh, Dr. Pratap Kollu for proposing the vote of thanks. Dr. Pratap, thank you. So it's an honor to present a uh, vote of thanks on behalf of uh, Center for Nanotechnology. So Center for Nanotechnology expresses gratefulness to the distinguished speaker and our guest Professor Jagdish Narayan for accepting our invitation and delivering a wonderful lecture. So today we got a really great experience and we have uh, really felt that the lecture is owned by us. So you have delivered the lecture starting from materials to the devices and so it's a wonderful lecture sir. Thank you very much. And uh, so I thank Honorable Vice Chancellor for supporting this event, Professor M. Ganshan Krishna, Director IOE, for giving us the presidential remarks, and he is also our IOE Director. So I thank him for the funding. So, one more, uh, Professor Patak. So, he connected Professor Jagdish Narayan to University of Hyderabad. So, I thank you very much, sir. Uh, and I thank the PR office and Nano Center staff for their support in all these arrangements. So we also thank Dean School of Licenses for giving us this uh, seminar hall. So uh, there are guests from uh, uh, RGU KT Basar. We thank the Vice Chancellor for allowing them. So and I thank my faculty colleagues, students, staff for coming and making this a this event a great success thank you very much sir